Thanks for checking out this movie review. So this is for the 1987 anthology film Creepshow 2. And I'm going to say off the bat, I think Creepshow 2 is probably about half as good, maybe a slight bit less than the original Creepshow. I'm sure there are a lot of people who would kind of agree with me on that one. It kind of looks like the budget got taken back a bunch. I don't know if that was actually true or not, but uh, maybe someone can enlighten me in the comments. Thinking about doing Creepshow 3 from 2006, but... If you want to warn me about that and say, no, definitely don't do it, or if you think I should definitely give it a crack, I've heard it's not so hot, so how bad is it? Go ahead and put some comments down there. Anyway, Creepshow 2, directed by Michael Gornick, uh, who did Tales from the Dark Side. He directed a few episodes of that. Uh, this is a big change because George A. Romero had directed the original Creepshow, and Stephen King had written the scripts for that, for each of the stories and, well, overall script, including those stories. Now, for this one, George A. Romero, still involved, he wrote the screenplay. He wrote the script with basically an outline from Stephen King, because all the stories came from Stephen King's stories. So he did the outline, then George A. Romero took it and wrote the script. So a lot of different stuff. I mean, directing's obviously different, the writing's obviously different, so you can really, really see that and tell but, you know, there are obviously things that they kept kind of in common with it. Uh, I think overall the the story, the feels of the stories are kind of similar, obviously, because in the first one and the second one, they all came from Stephen King, so that makes sense. They do try to keep that kind of little bit of a, a humor vibe to it as well, uh, a little bit of absurdity here and there. But I will say this. This was one of the interesting things. I would have thought that they would have continued with that kind of panels of the comics thing that they were doing in the first one and then like those flashes of interesting color at certain times but they totally did away with that I guess it's because they assumed that the actual animated portion of the wraparound story would kind of make up for that I don't think it does though uh, I think it just kind of puts it in its own area instead of incorporating it throughout the film so I don't think that works as well in my opinion we way, way better in the first one Daniel Beer, who ended up playing the character of Randy in The Raft, uh, actually apparently got hypothermia during the filming, and some people in, on the crew were really pushing to just keep going and get the film done, but uh, apparently Michael Gornick said, no, we have to stop because this could be serious, and apparently he was not doing well. Like, it definitely could have been a situation where if they just pushed forward, he could have died. So that is interesting to know, so good job, Michael Gornick on doing the right thing. And that's why you need directors who have a good moral compass and are actually concerned about their talent. Just saying. Tom Savini ended up playing the creep uh, in it. I think I thought he did a pretty good job, although I don't really like the design of the creep, the new one versus the one in the first one. The design in the first one looks really creepy and scary and interesting and cool, and obviously that's like practical effects. This one, and this is part of the reason I say it looks like they had less of a budget. This one just put some prosthetics on an actual person. It just looks like an old, old guy who's kind of creepy with like a ball sack chin, basically, if you feel me, especially in the comic ver or the uh, animated version. He's not that scary. He's not that interesting. I mean, the line delivery and the dialogue for him is pretty solid, but in comparison to the first one, it's just not as good. Now, apparently it's rumored, rumored, that Nicolas Cage was supposed to play the creep at, at one point. Now, I don't know if I believe that or not, because nowadays, when you go through and do research on it, a bunch of older films, you end up hearing, inevitably, you know, Nicolas Cage was considered for this, and Nicolas Cage was supposed to do this, and it's... I think it may, may be BS. I, I do feel like there are people out there who just kind of like to create this... this um, what am I looking for? This this myth about Nicolas Cage and kind of like build him up like a Bill Brasky or a, or a Chuck Norris type situation. So I don't know if I really believe that. But it was also rumored, apparently, that they considered using Arnold Schwarzenegger for the role of Old Chief Woodenhead in the Old Chief Woodenhead story, which um, that could have been interesting. But the thing is, like, you don't, he doesn't talk like you don't really see him because he's under so much prosthetics that it's like 
would it have really mattered? They really would have just been going for the size and then being able to tie his name to it. So I don't really know how that would have gone or if it really would have mattered all that much, honestly. Now, David Holbrook, star who starred in the Old Chief Woodenhead uh, short, his father, Hal Holbrook, starred in the Crate story in the very first Creep Show. So I thought it was cool that there was that connection right there. Obviously, the Crate, way better than Old Chief Woodenhead as a story. Way better. Two stories were actually cut from this, which I want to know why, because to me, it seemed like all three of the stories that were in this, not including the wraparound one, because that was very short, all three of the actual stories in this that were live action seemed like they were drawn out way too much, that they were trying to stretch them for a runtime. So instead of doing that, they really should have cut it back a bunch and then put one of these other stories in there. Have four stories instead. You can hit that hour and a half mark, which is basically what the movie is at the moment. Um, and it would have moved things a lot better because a lot of, actually all the stories, had really bad pacing issues, in my opinion. Now, if they would have cut them down, like I said, put another story in there, could have been a lot better. But the two stories that ended up being cut, one was called Cat from Hell, which actually ended up being in the movie for Tales from the Dark Side. And the other one was called Pinfall, which apparently was about a rival uh, rival ghost bowling teams. Honestly, I'm very interested in that. I would actually like to see a... Oh, I don't know if I want to say this. I, I was going to say I would like to see a feature length of that, but maybe I don't. I think you know, maybe it's a better bite size type thing. Just saying. The opening music is amazingly 80s. And I do love that because I'm from the 80s. I love 80s music, you know. So that kind of nostalgia to it, quite like it. So I'm going to review, like I did for the first Creep Show, I'm going to re individually review each of the stories, except the wraparound. That's not really much of a story. Uh, and then I'll do like an overall. This will be easy, though. You'll see the pattern. So for Old Chief Woodenhead, you can tell Ray has a hard time with change and accepting it. As the conversation that he has with Martha, his wife, first thing really shows that. It kind of shows this, um, this place used to be thriving. This used to be a nice area. Now, you know, it's fallen on hard times. Running this general store is really not working. But Rage is just refusing to move on. You know, it's speaking to that stubbornness of things were the way they used to be. And I'd like to see if maybe they can get back there. Like, Refusing to let go of the town, basically, and refusing also to realize that people in the town have changed, they're not as nice, they're not able to afford things, it's, you know, he wants to see the good in society, but Martha is kind of more the realist, who's kind of saying, look, you know, we got to face the facts about this, but Ray obviously trying to hold on. Uh, the acting, and actually this applies to all of the stories for the most part, acting is pretty rough. Uh, not very good at all. You do get some nice flourishes here or there, but for the most part, acting, not so good. And just when Ray and Martha are seeing the good in humanity, the pendulum swings the other way. Obviously, their, um, their interaction with Benjamin, who comes in and gives them something very valuable to hold on to for the time being while they owe, and then they say they'll pay it down and then get the thing back, um, that kind of, you know, lifts their spirits, makes them feel better about people. And then right on the heels of that, you have, I guess that's Benjamin's son, uh, come in, in with his two buddies and just busting things up, destroying stuff, stealing. Yeah. So it, it's this kind of like riding a high about humanity and then seeing the low of it, which I feel like all of us kind of experience that probably about on a daily basis. I know I do. Oh man, Holt McElhaney plays Sam in this. The the leader of this terrible group who busts into the general store. Um, I really loved uh, Holt McElhaney, uh, Mac McElhaney. Jesus, hard to say for, for me for some reason. I uh, really liked him in Fight Club. Really liked him in Mindhunters. Obviously, Mindhunters, he had way more of a role than in Fight Club, but great actor. Uh, so it was just kind of cool to see him in a younger role. And I thought, I wouldn't say his acting was like particularly good. It was pretty over the top, but it was fun is what I would say. Sam's talk about his hair and Hollywood is way too much. That's one of the things in general in this movie is that the dialogue's not that great. 
like the way the dialogue's written feels too chintzy it's way too basic it's too much of it because it's just wasting time that's one of those big time wasters i was talking about seeing in this film just a lot of the dialogue is just stupid and doesn't add anything and seems like a time waster and his whole talk about like look how great my hair looks look at how good i look i'm going to hollywood like it's fine to have that but the fact that it keeps going because it's a weird thing in the first place to have in there but it's fine to do it real quick but to just keep it going then people are just like what what is this about really the music in this one does get pretty over the top yeah the old chief woodenhead music is pretty over the top i don't think it's as over the top in the other ones but in this one it's really over the top and way too much and needs to really be pulled back chief woodenhead does look pretty cool and the kills are relatively okay um, a few of them kind of cool-ish, like the arrows in the large guy. I mean, that, that was okay. And like I said, Chief Woodenhead looking kind of cool. I did enjoy the design of Chief Woodenhead. Uh, this obviously plays heavily on the idea of karma, obviously. Because these guys show up, do something terrible, think they're going to get away from it. No, old Chief Woodenhead's coming and he's going to kill you. And then we're done with the story. So very old trope that gets used there it's fine overall out of five stars with half stars in play two stars on that one next is the raft okay so the use in the car sure are annoying and you actually just really hope that death ends up coming all their way and it kind of does uh, except oh yeah it does because i was thinking for a second well randy gets away no randy actually didn't end up getting away in the end he almost did so i'm glad they all got it because they're annoying and this is another one i was like, I was talking about, the dialogue's terrible. It makes you hate these people, pretty much. The thing in the water initially just looks like a large trash bag. Thankfully, when the, you look at it closer, it actually has more of, like, a texture to it. And also, when it starts coming out of the water, that's when it actually looks cool. That's when I like it. And then when people are getting consumed by it, it looks cool then, too. Uh, obviously, that's very kind of, like, blob-esque from the, the remake-type blob, which actually didn't come out at this point, but it makes you think about that. Um, yeah, that remake of The Blob was a year after Creepshow 2. Interesting. Uh, oh, also, I really like the touch of having the skin kind of disintegrating off people while that blob was on them. I really like that aspect of it. Um, this could have been a really good story, but it, it just felt like it stagnated. It felt like it was stretched for time. They needed more interesting stuff going on in it. Maybe just a higher body count. I don't know. Because it's, it's a decent concept. I like how Deke thinks Randy should know exactly what's going on in this situation since he's kind of the science guy, you know? Like, he makes comments. He's like, well, you know about science. Why don't you know what this is? You know about science. Well, what do we do, you know? <laughs> it's that typical, like, stupid writing. Like, not good dialogue. So Randy tries to uh, assault Laverne and then doesn't try to save her when the blob ends up grabbing her. So Randy was looking kind of like the good guy until, um, I think it was Laverne. It was either Laverne or Rachel. I think it was Laverne, though. Uh, he was looking like a good guy until she falls asleep, and then he moves in in a very horrible way to try to assault her. Uh, and then you're like, oh, no, he's actually a terrible human being. And then he takes the terribleness, to the next level when uh, the blob starts attacking her and he doesn't even try to save her. He doesn't even try to help her. He's, he literally sees what's going on and is like, well, actually, this is my chance to get away. So, And that's probably why he doesn't actually end up getting away because he has to pay. And like in the first one, there's that bit of karma at play here. And I do think the burp at the end, I think that was kind of funny. I really like that they added that at the very end with this blob thing burping. After eating, I'm a fan of that. This plays off fears of being isolated and too far from civilization to get help if, well, in the case that something ends up going wrong. Uh, I know I have that fear when I get out into the boonies. I'm just like, man, if I you know, run out of gas or have something wrong with my car or need some sort of help, have a medical emergency, whatever, like, potentially screwed. And this really, really plays to that. I think this also was potentially supposed to kind of hit a little bit of a chord about pollution and how potentially that's the origin of what this is it was kind of like 
uh, similar to something like an oil slick or plastic in the ocean, and then it's getting its revenge on people. This, two stars as well for the raft, in my opinion. Now the final one, the Hitchhiker. Uh, pretty quick way to set up Annie as a morally corrupt person when she's sleeping around on her husband. And then the hit and run happens. So they go very, very hard on showing you how terrible of a person Annie is. This is another one where it's like, we don't really care about anyone. At least in Old Chief Woodenhead, like, you liked Ray and Martha. And you liked Benjamin. But other than that, in, in the rest of that and all the other stories, you don't really like anyone. Everyone sucks. Like, you can't really root for anyone. And I think that's a mistake because it kind of takes people out of the actual fear aspects of it. Because you're not feeling the fear or feeling scared for any characters. You're more just sitting there being like, yeah, fine. Kill them. Like, that person sucks. I don't care. Kill them all. Like, it's, it's whatever. And just, sure... It's fun to watch films in that way sometimes as well, but if you're really trying to engage people, you gotta like have some sympathetic characters, really. Stephen King is a truck driver in this. Take note of that. Um, I'm sure most people caught that one, but some people might not, because he did look kind of different. Definitely a lot different than he did in, in the first Creep Show. The music takes the wacky aspect of this way over the top. Another instance of the music being too much. Not too much in the sense of the old Chief Woodenhead one, where it's just like beating you over the head, but this one, it's just giving it that zany, wacky feel, and it's just taking it overboard, in my opinion. So, similar situation, but not the same. The ramming scene, I really did like this, when the guy's like on the front of her, of her car, and she keeps slamming it into uh, the tree, and then he's like stuck on the tree, and just she just keeps going after it. Uh, that was a good portion. That's probably my favorite part of the entire movie, which really isn't saying a whole lot, but <laughs> it was. It, it felt brutal. It looked kind of brutal. The practical effects worked really well. I like that. You get the idea Annie is losing it. She was talking to herself before the hit and run happened, and it just devolves after that. It gets so much worse. So it, it seems like it's kind of her conscience that's coming for her. And I don't actually think that she committed the hit and run in the first place. I mean, you can see, or actually, um, actually she probably did. Sorry, I, I changed my mind on that. Because they took, they intentionally have you see these other people showing up to the scene with the guy there. Um, so I, I'm guessing maybe she's either being haunted by his ghost because he's been killed, or that's just her conscience coming for her at that point, because she tried to run. You know, it was, a, it was a literally a hit and run, making her even worse than just cheating on her husband, Even I mean, even paying for sex, uh, was hitting someone with her car and then keep going, trying to act like it's not a big deal. But your conscience will get you if you're a semi-decent person. I guess Annie kind of was then. Definite socioeconomic statement as well as racial in this one. Uh, it shows a rich white lady treating a black hitchhiker like his life does not matter at all, obviously. So you got the two things. Her t treating him like he doesn't matter because, you know, most likely doesn't have a whole lot of money because he's trying to hitchhike. And then on top of that, rich white lady standing in opposition to a what you're assuming is poor black man. Just saying. Um, makes sense for someone like George A. Romero to be down to put a story like that out there. Like I've said in my review of Creepshow, I believe that was the point in the, the one with the cockroaches as well. It was white versus black. Same thing, you know, rich white guy who's afraid of people who are black. Um, and that's shown quite prominently in that. I think this one is a little less subtextual like the, the Roach one is and way more in your face about it. So, you know, just overall points to how less subtlety with, with Creepshow 2 and less nuance and less finesse and a lot more just in your face, kind of brazen and lazy to a degree. So this story gets a two stars as well for The Hitchhiker. I right, So you can assume... My overall rating is two stars for Creepshow 2. The wraparound story would have been cool to see done in live action, actually, especially because of those giant man-eating plants. That's another thing. They could have just taken that wraparound story and added more to it. 
made it live action, cut down some of the other ones, or just put one of those original two that they cut in there, because, like I said, they needed to cut the other ones down. In general, the dialogue is not good. I already talked about that. And there's a lot of wasted time in each of the stories. You can definitely tell that they really were stretching that for runtime, which, like I said, doesn't make any sense because you cut stories. Like, all this stupid dialogue, all these, you know, trying to do things between characters that doesn't develop the characters or doesn't really establish anything about them, it was pointless. It's not good. You know, this isn't the best that George A. Romero has done. If you just watch Creepshow 1 and 2, you would probably come to the conclusion maybe Romero should just stick to directing because he does a great job with that. But then you you look and you see, oh, well, he did Day of the Dead, he did Dawn of the Dead, he did Night of the Living Dead. Obviously, he can write well. It's just in this point, at this point, not really. Oh, and it's important to point out that this film, Creepshow 2, came after Romero had done Day of the Dead. And before he did Monkey Shines, which I have not seen Monkey Shines. Obviously, I've seen Day of the Dead, but yeah. So anyway, uh, overall two stars on Creepshow 2. Uh, talk me out of, or out of it or talk me into it. Creepshow 3, should I do it? Put the comments down there. Also, just talk about your feelings in general about Creepshow 2. Uh, if you want to talk about the first one, you can as well, but I have a review for that on my channel, so better if you watch that and comment there. Um, do me a favor, hit subscribe if you can, and you can because it takes you a second, it costs you no money, and it is totally painless, and it helps me motivate me, keeps me going. When I watch movies like this that are kind of stinkers, take some wind out of my sails. But when I see people subscribing and people commenting, it keeps it going. So I appreciate that. But regardless, I really do thank you for taking your time to watch this, and until next time, keep it brutal.